Hello everyone, George here and we're back again with my implementation of Five Nights at Freddy's. And I have to say, we've got a lot of problems. I've been skipping over a lot of small issues with many of my models as I've been crafting things, and this video is all about the work that no one wants to really see or do. And that's one of the best reasons why it's a time lapse. And what I'm doing now is I'm going back into Maya and I'm dealing with the fact that Foxy in its current state is just not working for me in several of my algorithms and in terms of some of the coding I have to do. Uh, I had mixed materials with different sub objects causing all kinds of issues. And that's what I'm here to actually fix. Now, of course, while I'm in the middle of trying to fix everything, uh, of course, Substance Painter decides that, hey, it's time for us to install a new version and update, upgrade your license, which is exactly what you're seeing here. That's just the fun of uh, dealing with programs. Yay, now I get back to work and we load Foxy back in. And as I'm working with Foxy, I'm gonna notice several different problems that keep popping up. And that's problems with the actual model. Just aesthetically, I don't like how certain things are going. I try to make the model similar to what it was, but I'm not trying to replicate it perfectly to the design I had earlier. The idea is that the project has evolved, I've evolved, and I might want it to look a little bit different. Uh, so I start with just some standard brass and different metals and uh, adjust them. And I have to say, I'm going a little bit too much uh, Iron Man here at the beginning. I will change that later on. I don't know why, but those color schemes at the moment look good. We're playing around with what the interior metals are going to look like as well. And we end up going with something black, makes it look a little bit nicer. Uh, with the brass and then the metal on the outside as well. And uh, here we're just playing around, adding different types of metal to see what does and doesn't work. And I'm going to be taking these different uh, values and bringing them across all the other materials as I work layer by layer. Now I notice things are uh, pretty much fine for that part. And then I go ahead, uh, create an instance as a smart material and bring it into the other area. But as I'm working on the feet, I notice that there are little pockets of problems. On the thighs, for instance, the underlying muscle is peeking through, which has been a problem for a while now. Also, some of the legs are a little bit off. So I'm going back in here now and I'm adjusting the UVs. The UVs on the two feet ended up being in the exact same position. So I was doubling up the UVs. I want all my UVs to be unique in this particular case. So I go back in and fix all that issue as well. And then relay out the UVs. And then once the UVs have been laid out, I re-export the map out. However, you'll notice that my UV map right there looks like crap. And the reason for that, and the, the main thing is whenever you see things go to heck like that, you want to go back in and freeze your transforms, uh, specifically your rotate and your, really your scale. Your scale is the one you really want to fix. Now, while I was in the middle of doing that, Maya crashed. Once again, you'll notice that in my video series, it always seems like I'm in the middle of doing things with UVs when Maya becomes, uh, becomes unstable. And that's at least my my take on things with Maya is UV mode is a little unstable at times. And uh, I go ahead, export everything out. Everything's looking fine now. And uh, actually not quite fine. Uh, I also noticed that there's a big gap in the chest area in that little lower corner. So I go ahead and relay the or re relay those out. I mean, why not while I'm in here making these adjustments and I'm just double checking things, making sure the materials are situated uh, with the right pieces of the element, because that was a big problem I had before. And I'm going back out and relaying things um, in the UV editor just to make sure things are okay. Uh, it really doesn't change much, except for the fact that I'm gonna have to re-export this model out again. And then inside of Substance Painter, we're going to have to go and make some changes. Now here's where I'm deforming the, the muscle or whatever you wanna call it inside of that area, bringing that in a little bit. It, I, the deformation that I make on that model is so small that I'm really not expecting it to really change the UVs that much. So I don't go to go in and relay everything out and, and unwrap stuff again. Now I'm going back in and I'm modifying things because I'm starting to feel like, uh, yeah, this is a little too red and a little bit too gold. So we're uh, making some changes here and there, making things out. Here you can see the UVs are unique now across those different parts. I decide that the tips are going to be sort of a darker color, like they've been worn down, and then we'll make the inner, inner ones a little bit brassier. And as I'm looking at this foot, I notice something really weird, and that's the, there's a giant gap in the back of it. There's no socket for things to actually connect to, and that's something I'm gonna go back and change. And I also notice, as I jump into the face, just moving around from different parts, that several parts of the teeth are sunken in much deeper than other areas, they're recessed in. So here I'm fixing part of the calf muscle. I'm also going in and modifying a little bit of this muscle by using uh, the soft selection basically and pulling it out, just using standard transforms. Re-export everything out. And of course I'm gonna have to rebake everything once again. 
Now I'm trying to get away from the Iron Man and going back to more of the browns that we're a little bit more accustomed to with Foxy. So I'm adjusting that outer part to be a little bit darker. Now, unfortunately, I made the mistake of not making instances across my different materials. So you'll notice that as I make changes to those materials, I'm not getting the changes on the legs or on the head. And I'm going to have to go back and manually make those changes myself shortly by copying that layer and pasting into the other parts. But it's really not much of a problem at all. Now I'm just playing around with the different colors, pretty much just using the standard alternating color scheme of different pieces back and forth, back and forth, and uh, getting into those really hard to reach areas. And once again, I'm noticing those teeth and I'm just saying to myself, I really, before I go any deeper into this, I need to jump in there and do something about that soon inside of Maya. Now I'm copying that material over, bringing it down into those legs, making sure everything is pretty much good to go. And just once again, adding that black material to the uh, back sides or the dark gray. And of course we're back in here. Now is where I'm like, I need to stick something in that ball socket. So I make just a sphere, reduce down the size of it. So it's something, you know, we can actually deal with. Rename it to left and right knee, I believe, or something like that. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and take those UVs, relay them out, make sure that they have the right material associated with them. And then we're going to export everything back out in just a minute once we get to that step. So yeah, so we go ahead once again, a lot of back and forth, but that's what happens when you are fixing things and you're dealing with a lot of mistakes. It's just going to be jumping back and forth between these programs and wasting a lot of time, you know, rebaking out the meshes, making sure all the different parts are working properly. But now we actually have, you know, sockets or, or kneecaps or something uh, in that area. And, and what you just saw me doing was actually trying to make instances of the materials across the different layers. I probably screwed that up because I don't do it very often. Um, this is one of the few exceptions where I, I'm really reusing that material over and over again across the entire object. Now I'm just taking a back look and you know, I have to say, I don't really love the dimensions of my Foxy character at this part. I think the head's too big. I don't think the arms are long enough. Uh, I think the legs are too short, but we've go come so far at this point with all the work that we're doing. That I'm really not interested in going back in and fixing that kind of stuff. Well, we're just going to let it be uh, what it is unless I uh, one night really get an inkling to uh, make some changes. Here we're going in and adjusting those teeth, moving them up so that we can actually see some of the, uh, what I guess I'll call is the mechanical enamel of the tooth and the gum line and so forth, just so that, you know, it's, we have that geometry there. It might as well be up for show. So uh, otherwise I might as well just delete it to optimize things better off. Okay, once again, another bake. So we're gonna sit here for a little bit. Obviously, when you have this many materials and this much of much geometry going on, these bakes take a while. And this video is sped up by a factor of 10. So, you know, I'm sitting around on my butt a lot waiting for things to actually happen. So once again, uh, we just make the top parts the metal color and or the, the dark metal color and then the other parts like that brassy color and then the other part, um, uh, just the standard brass or uh, bronze. Excuse me. Bronze is the darker one. Brass is the lighter one. That's what I meant to say. And I'm just playing around with things here and there, just trying to see what I like. Um, and you know, for the most part, I'm happy. So I go ahead and decide to find the folder uh, where I'm gonna put this thing, export out the different materials using Unity 5 Occlusion. We're not using the new high definition rendering pipeline at this point. Um, I also take the time to just look at it under different lighting conditions, um, just to see what it actually looks like in a high quality mode. Uh, I'm kind of interested in, in seeing how these materials really pop. Now it's time for us to export everything out and bring it into Unity at some point. So we're gonna go ahead and export out our object. Now, what Foxy is right now is, an, is, a, is a huge number of sub game objects all connected together. And we are not going to let Foxy be that. So I'm going through right now and I'm combining the different assets by material level. I don't know why I'm doing that. In fact, in just a few seconds, I'm probably going to abandon that, or at least a minute from now, and realize that uh, the game, when we assemble the animatronic, has nothing to do with these different sub elements as they are, um, you know, as one solid giant piece. So I'm going to stop this, resave the file out, and then start a new one that has to deal with um, all the different layers that I built up inside of it. But in order for me to know what layers I need to create, I first load up Unity and then use that as reference to see which pieces need to be um, together. So we have the feet, that's one set. So I'm going in there and uh, merging those feet together. Then we've got the uh, shins or the calves and I merge all those different elements together. And then we've got the next set, which are the quads, you know, the upper part of the leg, merge all that together. And I'm really taking my time this, this 
in this instance to make sure that I'm not screwing things up. Uh, I'm grabbing the tail, the lower pelvis, then we're going to do the interior, and we're going to do the exterior of both parts. So those are each going to be components that you use to assemble it. And then we're going to do the left arm and the right arm as well after that. And here I'm going through and just really making sure I'm grabbing the right materials because what I don't want to have are sub objects on my my uh, object because that kind of screws with my algorithm. And while I could go back and adjust my algorithm to deal with sub objects, I just don't want to. It's going to be easier and just more correct in the long term for these objects to not have sub materials or, or s to utilize multiple materials per object. So that's just something I'm not going to mess with. Now I'm just checking it out, making sure everything's OK. Uh, we're going to export this stuff out to Unity and bring it in. And then I'm going to have to deal with, uh, well, now the pivot points. So a big issue with the algorithm for making the uh, pieces snap together, there, there's a couple different layers to it. There's the assembly piece, then there's the snap point, and then there's, of course, the manager. And the snap points are necessary because that's a collider where you grab the object, move it to that location, and it snaps to it. So I need to make sure I have those, and it's just easier for me to set them up inside of Maya and export them out using locators. Locators are, of course, just empty game objects. When they go over to Unity, it's just going to be a transform on the node. We're not going to have a mesh filter or a mesh renderer, so they're perfect for just having uh, locations recorded. And these snap points are going to end up being the same positions as uh, where the transforms are for each piece. And one thing I'm doing is I'm adding the snap points. And from time to time, when I remember, I'm also using the DV key to snap the transform for each one of those snap points to the correct location. So for instance, I'll grab the tail and then I'll move the tail uh, pivot point to that transform as well. That way everything lines up just fine. And yes, this is not fun. This is a tedious process. But once again, it's necessary in order for the underlying algorithm I've generated to work properly with the model. Um, and that's why this is a time lapse video. So it's been a while since I remember, uh, it's been a while, so I don't quite remember how this algorithm worked. So I decided to take a few minutes and just reacquaint myself to the different uh, scripts that I'm using. Looks like I'm only using three. And I already mentioned them, the assembly manager, which is what starts the entire process off. And really all it does is turn off all the other pieces of the animatronic and then uh, uh, enables the lowest level elements. Then we have the assembly piece, which is the piece you actually pick up. And those are going to be littered throughout the area uh, inside of the animatronic um, you know, repair room. And then there's the snap point. And the snap point is really the king of everything. That's the one that creates a virtual uh, holographic piece so that you know where to place the next piece on, on it. it. It does almost all of the heavy lifting for just about everything. So that's why it's necessary for me to take the time to create those snap points and make sure they work. And now I'm just going through and making sure my pivot points on all those objects are okay. You'll notice that I just deleted some geometry. Uh, I know it's kind of late in the game to do that, but I know, but it's just like a couple extra polys that got kind of created when I mirrored something. So they looked secluded and kind of set by themselves. So I figured it's okay, it's fine if I delete these, I'll just have to remember to go back to the other model and delete them as well. Otherwise, I'm going to run into all kinds of issues. And it's only like three or four polys. It's not going to be a big deal in the UV space either. All right. This is where we're going to waste some time. And that's because I need to replicate everything that I had done with Foxy, the old model, which you'll notice has no material associated with it because I had to get rid of all the materials to make it work properly um, because I had screwed up having multiple uh, multiple materials on a single object. Now I'm going through and I'm uh, attaching the associated materials to each component, making sure that looks good. I'm already liking how it's looking. It's looking pretty good to me. Um, few tweaks here and there I might want to make. I think the brass is a little bit too shiny, uh, but until I have this in a room with reflection probes going on, uh, I really won't know how it looks because it, it just could be shiny because I've got nothing for it to reflect uh, in the area. Now I'm going through, I'm adding uh, sphere colliders to all of the, um, uh, the snap points because that's the snap point is where you snap to, so you got to have that. I'm also going through adding assembly pieces to all the pieces of the object. And I'm from time to time re-looking at the code, just making sure that I'm doing the right thing and that there's nothing else required of me. Um, and I'm also splitting things up. I'm doing a test there. I just made everything fall apart. Uh, I need to go in there and I realize I'm using really generic colliders and I should take my time and create 
at least some collider geometry that better fits the object. Now, of course, with, what was it, Unity 2017 or somewhere between 5 and I think 2017, they got rid of the ability for DirectX to use colliders that are concave. So now everything's got to be convex. So I don't take a lot of time refining these colliders down because I, when I turn on the con, uh, make it convex option, it's going to optimize that mesh. Really, all I'm trying to do is I believe there's a limit uh, to how many polygons you can have as a mesh collider now when it, it is um, converting it over into a convex uh, object. So I'm keeping things very vague in general, um, realizing that whatever I create is going to be modified by Unity in some way, but getting it close enough. Uh, and at least this way, I've got objects that are better than a box collider or a pill collider for each one of these different components. And it's not a terribly fun process. I don't know about you, but uh, adding colliders to things is something that I do later. Uh, it's, it's, it's where I, if I'm working with a group of people, which I almost never am, uh, unfortunately, um, it's where the, the guy asks me or the girl asks me, hey, you gave me this level environment, but I'm falling through the floor. Can you please give me some colliders? And that's where I'm like, ah, fine, I'll throw it together last minute. Uh, the tail is interesting because it's going, it is very concave, uh, the entire top part of it is, and that's going to get all optimized away and flattened out, and it's not going to really follow the shape at all, in which case I might need to, um, w when you see it in here, you'll notice, you'll see what I mean, but I might need to make multiple colliders for that to make it actually work a little bit better um, so that it's not this giant lump. Same thing with the head. In a few moments, I'm gonna tackle the head and that's got these funky ears and you know, the sides of the hair sticking out and so forth. And that, when you bring it in as a mesh, just kind of turns into a giant mess of a giant head. Uh, a, just a, you might as well just throw a, a box collider around it to tell you the truth. Um, so that's another part that I'm probably going to need to subdivide into multiple um, uh, individual colliders so that it's not quite so nasty. Once again, hey Maya, you crashed on me. Thanks very much. Um, so reopen Maya. Luckily, I didn't really lose a whole lot of work. Um, I'm not sure what the crash was about, but uh, it had something to do with me trying to do the extrusion from both sides. And uh, it, it doesn't matter. I didn't lose a ton of work. I was able to open up the temporary save file, which is something that Maya has gotten better with, you know, it's saving out a temporary file when things actually finally go bad and I can uh, save and I can grab my work again. Now we're dealing with the chest area and I decide that the internal one is going to be the same as the external. You know, there's the external plating and the internal plating. I just duplicate it and then give it each one a separate name. And I use the, the naming convention foxy underscore colliders as the group and then C underscore whatever the name of the object is that's going to be its collider. That way all the, when I'm doing a search, everything's C underscore something and it's easy for me to find and sort of, um, you know, at this point in this project, we've got a mess of so many different objects. Naming conventions are becoming incredibly important, uh, especially with the models and assets that I'm bringing in. And that's why I'm taking the time to make sure that, you know, I've got a naming convention that makes my life easier when assembling these different objects. And, in the same, and I'm doing that just for myself. It goes like triple for when you're working with a team of people and you want things to be easy. You got to have a naming convention that lets people search for things and they can always count on. Anyway. That's pretty much it for this. Uh, in the next video, we're going to jump back in and do a lot more with Foxy, I'm sure. I really want to get the animatronic playing part ready to go so that we can uh, actually assemble the thing inside of that room so we have some real gameplay that I can finally say, yay, I've actually accomplished something. See you all next time. So long. Goodbye.